Hi, if you're still just coming in, please come to the front. And if you're sitting on the edge of the aisles, please move in. Um, we have enrollment of over 400, and this room only sits, uh, seats 350, so we're going to need to squeeze in a little bit. Well, that means about 50 kids are not here today. <laughs> All right, hi, everyone. Let's get started. So uh, we're still working on a few technical glitches. We're, we're going to obviously move to a different room. We don't know when it will be. It'll be maybe this coming Wednesday, if not Wednesday, but it's coming Monday. It'll either be, I hope, Science Center B, which is right next door. Uh, there's a chance we may go to Sanders. We'll, we'll see. We'll let you know by email. Uh, AEO letters need to go to Gabe by today. Uh, online sectioning will be open tonight. tonight. We'll be online sectioning. We'll have 23 sections. We're going to have some at the quad, maybe. We might have one at the quad. Uh, we'll have some. We will have one at the quad, uh, and uh, maybe two, and, uh, and uh, we will, um, the sections will begin meeting next week. It always takes us long to sort out the number of TFs and locations and everything else. Uh, we're going to start posting the videos uh, of the lectures very soon. Last year's videos are still available uh, if you have an urgent need to see something you haven't seen already, and slide PDFs will start going up very soon as well. Like every other week, typically, we post the slides. Any other announcements? Yes. Um, so you have two assignments tonight. One is the sectioning. The other is that you should be receiving an email from someone named Peter Truitt in the sociology department. Um, so please make sure that that email um, doesn't go to your spam filters. Um, he is going to be asking you to fill out a survey in this course about what counts as a disease. And we will post the results online um, and, and oh, show in them class. in class on a couple of lectures from now. A couple of lectures from now, Actually, okay? The, e the email may come. Uh, the email may come from my from the medical school because he uh, works at my lab over there. So anyway, you'll get a little Google Doc. You have to go. You have to very. It'll take you 10 minute exercise. You'll learn a lot from it. I guarantee it. You have to click yes, no. Is this condition a disease or not? Is it a concern of doctors or not? And all those results will then be collated, and I'll be discussing them in class in two lectures or something like that. Okay. Also, if you haven't, um, if you're planning to take the course pass fail, but you needed my signature, I'm in the back after a uh, lecture and I have pass fail forms. Um, and finally, um, I've gotten a few emails from some of you that you haven't been able to access the Cutler reading online. Um, apparently, I talked to Lamont Library, the university only allows one person across the entire university to access it at a time. Uh, <laughs> and we have no control over that, so don't rely on that to do the reading. Thanks. Okay, so leave, uh, leave some room at the aisle so people can sit down closer to and fill up some of the seats, okay? All right, so last time we discussed how life expectancy at birth has increased dramatically over the last 100 years and how this is part of a broader phenomenon known as the health transition. And part of this health transition has also involved a shift in the causes of death and the nature of illnesses prevalent in the population, a shift from acute infectious diseases and nutritional deprivation to chronic diseases and mental disorders has taken place over the last 100 years and longer or shorter, depending on which country you're in, as part of the health transition. In addition, there's been a compression of morbidity, as we saw, so that we are living longer, dying of different things, and are healthier while we live. All three things are happening. We also reviewed ways of defining health, and we talked about the statistical, adaptive, and social uh, ways of defining health, and some ways of measuring health, and in particular, utility. And finally, we considered the problem of medicalization, and we noted the irony that as mortality has been decreasing, more and more seemingly or previously tangential items are added to the list of what is deemed a legitimate concern of doctors. For example, last time we saw these data, uh, we saw uh, sort of the transition in the causes of death over the last 100 years. This is 1900, this is 2000. This is the rate per 100,000 leading killers uh, per 100,000 deaths. Pneumonia, tuberculosis, diarrhea, all uh, sort of infectious causes of death are the leading killers. And then on down the list. And cancer goes from being uh, number eight on the list to being number two on the list, for example, in the last 200 years. And most of the infectious causes fall off the list or drop on the list. So we still have pneumonia and influenza. We've got a couple of other infectious type things. They were there. It's still here, but things like TB and diarrhea, you know, fall off the list of leading killers. So today, let's see if we can understand why this has happened. Does this have something to do with modern medical care 
and with discoveries in the kinds of medicines and treatments and procedures that doctors can do for patients over the last hundred years? Or are there other, um, uh, or are there other reasons that these diseases have been declining across time? Now, certainly, there have been extremely impressive medical advances uh, in the last uh, century. So we've, we've had, at the beginning of the previous century, the discovery of aspirin. Actually, aspirin, the, the use of the bark that, from which one could extract aspirin had been known for some time. But the, sort of the isolation and the definition of aspirin took place about 100 years ago. Blood transfusions, uh, the invention of electrocardiography, insulin in the 1920s. Beginning in the 1930s, we have actually one of the salient accomplishments, to my eye, of human civilization in the last 10,000 years which is the discovery and invention of antibiotics. Um, so you have first the sulfonamide antibiotics in the 1930s, and then eventually the penicillin-based antibiotics towards the late 1930s, early 1940s. 1952, you get polio vaccination. 53, the structure of the DNA, of DNA is elucidated, oral contraceptives. Beginning in the 1960s, uh, organ transplantation, um, then eventually CT scanners, and most recently, anti-HIV medications. And all of these, no doubt, have had substantial life-saving effects in individual recipients to whom these technologies had been targeted. And they have also, no doubt, improved the health of the population. In fact, it's reasonable to ask, therefore, whether the discovery of antibiotics 60 years ago or so had something to do with the decline of infectious diseases. Maybe one of the reasons they fall off the top of the list of causes of death 100 years ago to today has something to do with the discovery of these specific treatments around uh, the mid middle of the last uh, century. Well, you can also get a sense of the changes in the delivery of medical care by looking at photographs of hospitals. This is what a typical hospital uh, looked like about 100 years ago in 1893. And you come forward about 60 years, and now you have this. You have a nurse as well who's administering some soup uh, uh, to the patient. And, uh, or maybe you get a little bit more technology. Here you have some rope and a little bar or something uh, that could be used for various purposes, pull themselves up, maybe some exercise or brace an extremity or something uh, like that. And then you come forward to the modern era, and it looks you know, completely different, uh, the kind of health care that can be delivered to patients uh, in a hospital. And in fact, the changes are so dramatic for some patients that a kind of guide is required. Here's a brochure put out by the Society for Critical Care Medicine. Uh, the name of the brochure is, what will my loved one look like uh, after they're admitted to the hospital? And here's a little handy dandy map of all the kinds of tubes and stuff that can come uh, uh, into or out of uh, patients. In fact, doctors sometimes jokingly refer to patients as having you know, five point restraints. For example, if they have their arms and legs, let's say, tied down and a catheter, for example, that would be a five-point restraint or something. So, so here, look at all these things, you know, heart monitor leads, pulse oximeter, Foley catheter, peripheral IV, blah, 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 nasogastric tube. Every, every opening that you could imagine could have a tube in it, uh, plus other ways that you could get access uh, to the human body. And in fact, you could argue that technology has advanced to the point where people or their loved ones actually need a manual if they're in the hospital to understand, you know, what might be happening to them. And this manual is intended to inform people of the possible existence of and use of all these various lines. And there's a suggestion in the title of this pamphlet that patients might even be made to look unrecognizable, that they might be rendered unrecognizable by the kind of grip of modern medicine, the application of the full force of our technology onto these patients. And there's still another way that we can get an understanding of the changes that have taken place. We can actually talk to people who are still alive and ask them, what's it been like over the last uh, 60 years or so in your practice of medicine? Here's a, a doctor I interviewed uh, now 20 years ago now almost uh, about his experiences. And he said, when I was a young doctor in the 1940s, we were led to believe that certain diseases had certain courses. For instance, there was nothing we could do for individuals who had subacute bacterial endocarditis. That's a bacterial infection in the lining of the heart. It's very dangerous still. We were taught that you couldn't cure that and that the course of the disease was two to three months. You could be much more definitive in those days. We didn't have anything we could do for patients. For instance, Addison's disease due to tuberculosis was another one for which there wasn't anything you could do. They all died. And roughly, we could divide leukemics into acute leukemics and those with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, 
and we knew that the latter would live for a much longer period of time. We could give them a little radiation or something, whereas the acute leukemics would die. Most kids with leukemia in my early days all died. We just began to get antibiotics when I was in school. Penicillin just came in about that time, what little became available. Before that, people who got pneumococcal meningitis, most of them died. But we didn't have much to do about it. We knew that if they had meningitis, well, it's a bad disease. So here's a guy who can actually describe for you this actual incredible transformation in the deployment of our capacity as human beings to invent things to improve the human condition and tell you, give you first person testimony as to what's happened over the last 100 years. So it would seem, given the data I've shown you so far, given the very real changes in medicine, changes which people who are alive actually experience and can give testament to, it would seem that medicine was a big part of the improvements in life expectancy that we've seen in the last 100 years. So this is an illustrative cartoon. Imagine we plot the number of people dying of a particular condition, say measles, uh, per 100,000 population on the y-axis against time, say since 1900 on the x-axis. And I want you to think for a moment, when do you think that a specific medical treatment for the disease in question might have been introduced? When did human beings discover a treatment for this abstract condition? Let's say measles. Was it at point A, at time point B, time point C, D, or E? So raise your hands if you think it was at point A. Be brave, be brave. I mean, not taking records. OK, A's. B's, who think it's at B? The majority so far. C, lesser number, D, and then E. Well, here are the data based on measles. These are more, a mortality rate per 100,000 for measles based on the last 100 years. It's fluctuating from year to year. And this is the first introduction of effective treatment for measles. It's a viral disease. We didn't have antivirals in the 1940s or 1950s. That took place here way after measles was no longer a significant killer in our population. So E was the right answer. There are like three or four of you that raised your hand uh, for E. And this kind of analysis was introduced by a British medical historian by the name of Thomas McEwen. And it was raised by somebody sitting over there uh, last or a couple of lectures ago. And it was very influential in stimulating people's thinking about this topic. Now, incidentally, let's say that uh, measles mostly affects young people, which it does. Do you think that this decline here might be due to an increasing aging of our society? So for example, maybe something that's happening is people are living longer and getting older. So more of the people who die are elderly. Therefore, less of them could die of childhood diseases. Elderly people don't die of childhood diseases. So maybe part of the reason that measles mortality is declining across time has, is an artifact simply of people getting older. People understand the concern? So we would have to somehow adjust for the age of the population if we really wanted to make the claim that measles mortality was declining. We couldn't compare a young population with lots of people dying from measles to an old population with few people dying of measles and say the latter population isn't suffering from the disease anymore. Maybe it's simply the age structure of the population that's changed, and that could explain uh, the difference. In fact, if you do that kind of adjustment with measles, it would turn out that, uh, that, this, that this pattern still would exist even after accounting for the changing age structure in the population. And this notion of adjusting for other factors is something we're going to return to today and in future lectures. And in fact, again and again, we see this pattern. So this is taken from a summary that was published a few years ago. Here's measles and when the vaccine was uh, invented. Here's tuberculosis and the discovery of the first effective treatment, isoniazide. Here's scarlet fever and the discovery of its first effective treatment, penicillin. Here's typhoid and the discovery of its first effective uh, treatment, chloramphenicol. Again and again, these modern discoveries that specifically treated these diseases weren't discovered until after the diseases were no longer significant threats to the population. And so the general and by now obvious point is that it was not, in fact, specific medical interventions, discoveries, or treatments that are primarily responsible for the decline in mortality for all of these infectious diseases in the last century. So if it's not medical care, what is it? Well, before we answer that, let's consider a non-infectious illness. So scurvy is a non-infectious disease. It results from a deficiency in vitamin C. And vitamin C is functionally most relevant for collagen synthesis. 
And the typical pathological manifestations of vitamin C deficiency are noted in collagen-containing tissues, such as the skin, cartilage, the teeth, the, where your teeth are inserted into your bones, your bones, and capillaries. And you get lots, you, if you have scurvy, you begin to lose your teeth, and you get bleeding in multiple organs and in mucous membranes and the skin. And a person with this ailment looks pale, feels depressed, and can be partially immobilized. And scurvy was at one time very common among sailors who were at sea much longer than perishable fruits and vegetables, which are the principal sources of vitamin C in our diet, uh, could be made, uh, uh, stored or made available. So here is the case of measles plotted along the cases of uh, scurvy. So on the y-axis is the measles mortality rate per 100,000 uh, shown in uh, you know, bright purple and little squares. And on the right is scurvy mortality rate per 100,000 shown in the blue. Uh, and in little uh, 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 diamonds, and as you can see, both of these decline in parallel. But the treatment for scurvy, vitamin C, doesn't do anything for measles, and the treatment for measles, vaccination, doesn't do anything for scurvy. So something else must have been happening that was causing these two very different forms of mortality to decline in parallel. From this relationship between scurvy and measles, one could surmise that generally, perhaps, that general improvements in human uh, well-being must be at work, since measles treatments don't treat scurvy and vice versa. That is, an increase in public health awareness and a decline in poverty were most likely responsible for the decline of infectious diseases. Now, this pattern we've been discussing is not totally uniform, and certainly some conditions yielded more, uh, yielded not just to socioeconomic changes and improvements, but also to specific uh, medical interventions. Here's a more detail on the uh, decline in pneumonia, which is a bacterial disease uh, that affects the lungs, um, uh, and that can sometimes, at least 100 years ago, was, or up to 60 years ago, was hard to distinguish from influenza, which is a viral illness. So in the olden days, those conditions were combined, pneumonia and influenza, one due to bacterium, one due to a virus. It was often hard for doctors to know the difference, uh, so they were sort of seen as a pneumonia, uh, if you will. And the decline in this condition, this combined condition, was clearly afoot already by the late 1930s, but the discovery of sulfonamides and penicillin antibiotics seems, in fact, to have had a big effect. So there was already some decline taking place beginning 1900 until you know, the late 1930s, but here we have the discovery of antibiotics, and you really see some kind of precipitous decline and then a kind of steady state after that. So there was probably, in fact, there was a role for antibiotics in this particular set of conditions. Who knows what this spike is here? Yeah, the Spanish flu, right? Exactly. So 1917 or 19, yeah, 17, uh, you get a big spike in worldwide mortality. M tens of millions of people around the planet die from this worldwide epidemic, this pandemic, of a viral pathogen, of influenza, not of a bacterial pathogen, not of uh, pneumonia. Now, the thing that's so interesting to me about uh, penicillin and the antibiotic, the discovery of antibiotics, in that in many ways, this success, this manifest, enormous success, has cursed medicine ever since. Penicillin turned a disease that was generally fatal, pneumonia, uh, into one that rarely was. And it was truly a miracle. But there has, in fact, never been another drug that had as big an effect as the discovery of penicillin. In some sense, penicillin has caused problems because it's raised expectations about the power of medicine to levels that have been impossible to repeat. So, Penicillin was this extraordinary moment in, in uh, the history of medicine in the last 100 years, an incredibly powerful drug that was incredibly effective at treating a condition that was otherwise often fatal and uniformly working in the population. And so it has raised our standards or our expectations about what might be achieved with other discoveries, and to my eye, there's never been anything like it uh, remotely. Well, we can get other sorts of data on the utility of medical care with respect to public health beyond some of the uh, historical graphs that I've been uh, showing you so far. For example, we could imagine an experiment in an ideal world. We say, okay, well, what's the role of big medicine? Uh, to what extent does medical care improve the lives of patients? Well, let's do an experiment where we just wave a wand and remove all the doctors on alternate days from the society, or recreate a society which lacks all modern medicine. Well, we obviously can't do any experiments like that, but we might be able to approximate something like that by a natural experiment uh, and that's in the form of the very, very rare cases where doctors go on strike. 
And your readings today provide data from five strikes by doctors that have taken place around the world between 1976 and 2003. And these stri strikes lasted between nine days and 17 weeks. And the analysis showed that the mortality of human beings while the doctors in the area or the country were on strike either stayed the same or got better. Uh, uh, and in some cases, this improvement in mortality after the doctors were on strike persisted even after the doctors returned to work. And none of the situations has ever found an increase in mortality during the time period that the doctors were on strike or immediately thereafter. And a number of explanations have been advanced for this. One potential explanation, which is the one I'm going to be trying to advance for the rest of the semester, is that actually the doctors don't play such a big role in improving mortality uh, in a society. Actually, they're much more important determinants, and I'm going to be pounding at that uh, for the next uh, few weeks. But other explanations might be that during the strikes, the doctors delay you know, uh, uh, optional surgery or, or uh, elective surgery, and that you know, maybe there was some mortality associated with elective surgery, so they delay the surgery, and so mortality drops. Or, as we'll be discussing in a few lectures, doctors can cause injuries to patients in the course of their care. This is known as iatrogenesis, or doctor-caused injury, during the strike, there's less of that, let's say, and that might be one of the things that's contributing to the lowering of mortality. Thus, the category, the sources of gains in life expectancy during the 20th century can be divided broadly into two categories. First at the top, we have medical care, or big medicine. Doctors, tests, treatments, things like penicillin, CAT scans, those kinds of things we discussed at the beginning. That's one big category of things that may, uh, may have been influencing the gains in life expectancy. Uh, and at the bottom, we have socioeconomic change and public health interventions, things that, like nutritional improvements, sanitation and prevention, behavioral changes in the population, or a rising wealth in the population. A society gets richer, maybe health improves for that reason, and maybe that's the main driver for improvements in health rather than the discovery of, uh, of medicines or the implementation of big medicine. And mostly, in fact, I would say it's the latter. And Preston, in the reading for today, downplays the role of nutri nutritional improvements specifically, at least in the United States in the 20th century, and he may be right, but the other things probably have played a big role even in the United States in the last 100 years. Now, to be clear, I'm not denigrating the role of science or the importance of medicine, since after all, it was the germ theory of disease which led to great strides in prevention of infectious diseases. As we begin to understand the etiology of diseases, we can develop preventive techniques. And so that scientific advance is important in the implementation of public health interventions and crucial for the adoption of hygienic practices, water cleanliness, and so forth. Plus, I'm a doctor myself, and it would be very hard for me to admit that I've wasted decades of my life doing something that's utterly futile. <laughs> um, so I, I don't want to be seen as too pessimistic, but I do want to cultivate in you some significant skepticism, at least at the population level, about the role of big medicine. Clearly, both sources are important, but big medicine is not the sole or even the main course of increasing life expectancy. Now, it turns out that these benefits in life expectancy were differ these, uh, these improvements in life expectancy were differentially distributed by socioeconomic status. And this resulted in widening SES differentials in mortality. And this itself also helps provide insights into the source of mortality decline. So the argument now is, OK, people are living longer, fair enough. But not everyone is living longer equally. People at the bottom of the totem pole aren't gaining as much as people at the top of the totem pole. And if that's the case, we should see a widening of gaps. If you go back in time, the rich and the poor, let's say, should have more equal life expectancy, whereas you come forward in time, the gap should be widening. And furthermore, if that's the case, the next intellectual step is to say, well, if that's true, this provides us additional insight into what are the main determinants of population health, if, in fact, we're seeing these widening uh, gaps. So here, are, uh, here is some additional data taken uh, from the readings. These are the mortality rates in children according to father's occupation in 1895, 1905, and 1923. And Preston argues that the new hygienic practices associated with the germ theory were more likely to be adopted by the professional classes. And if so, and if they were effective, one should see widening of social class differences over this period and a change in class vulnerability. 
So these data illustrate uh, this point. So if you go back in time and you look at the mortality in kids according to father's occupation, so was the dad a professional, physician, dentist, veterinarians, or a teacher, was he a farmer or a laborer, or was he involved in manufacturing, and if so, was he a manager, a foreman, or a laborer? And this is the mortality of this guy's children. All children are set to have a mortality of 100. And you can see that physicians, dentists, and teachers don't have any better mortality in their children than the average of children in that period of time. And the best are the managers and the farmers. Their kids have the lowest mortality. If you come forward in time to 1923, however, you see a complete reversal. At this point in time, you see that the knowledge, people with knowledge, uh, are able to uh, deploy that knowledge for something they should clearly care a lot about, namely reducing the mortality of their own kids, and that the mortality in these individuals is significantly lower than the mortality of the others. Now, the managers still have a relatively low mortality uh, over here, uh, and the farmers are beginning to lose some ground uh, over this 30-year uh, uh, period. So in 1895, the mortality rate in the children of doctors and other professionals was no different than the overall mortality rate. And incidentally, this also indicates fairly clearly that physicians had few weapons at their disposal to improve survival. Because if they did, they'd clearly be deploying them in their own children. So their children are faring no better than average, so the doctors probably didn't know much that they could do to improve health in that situation. And interestingly, the children of relatively well-off farmers and manufacturers, of course, because they were rich, is the argument, had better than average mortality. So it's not access to medicine. It's access to knowledge that helps. Incidentally, this pattern may be rep repeating itself today with respect to the adoption of dietary and other practices that reduce mortality from chronic diseases as opposed to acute infectious diseases. So nowadays, what we're seeing is that upper SES people are quicker to adopt behavioral practices such as smoking cessation that reduce mortality from chronic diseases, as we'll also see later in the class. So nowadays we see new discoveries, new inventions about the cause of and prevention of illness are made. People like you adopt those changes. People who are poor and relatively uneducated do not. And this use of deployment of knowledge uh, increases uh, the health, uh, the gaps between the rich and the poor. Well, let's look at how educational differentials in mortality overall are widening more generally. This figure is also taken from your reading. In particular, note the middle panel. Uh, this shows for individuals uh, between ages 65 and 74 years of age. Uh, this shows in 1960 versus uh, you know, 15 or so years later what's happening to uh, uh, mortality rates in men in black and women in uh, dotted line. And what you can see, for example, if you look at the men, is that in 1960, the mortality for 65 to 74-year-olds is equal regardless of how much education you have, zero to seven years, whatever that is, I can't read it, nine to some odd years, and then let's say college, more college education. And you can see that the gap from here to here is much bigger than from here to here over this uh, time period. And it's widened both for the men uh, and to a lesser extent, but also uh, for the women. And this occurred even over a time period when Medicare, which is our public health, our, uh, our, our, our national health insurance program for the elderly, if you're elderly in America, you get socialized medicine. You get health care that is reimbursed uh, by the government, which was introduced between 1960 and 1984. So this gap occurred even though we provided free health care to all the people that were in that age category between 65 and 74 years of age. This suggests that it is still not big medicine that is driving improvements in health. It suggests that widening class differences and also the broader improvements in health and life expectancy are still being driven more by increasing SES and other non-medical practices in the late 20th century as in the early 20th century. Again, it's access to knowledge about prevention that appears to be key. So the fact that we have a socioeconomic stratification of mortality suggests even in people who have free access to medical care, suggests that it's not medical care that's the real issue here, but rather socioeconomic status or some other more primary factor that could be taking uh, place. And a similar pattern of continuing widening differentials, despite the broadening of access to health care, was seen in the United Kingdom, comparing the time before and after the introduction of the National Health Service at an earlier historical point in 1948. Now I'd like to come forward to the second half of the 20th century and examine the two current leading killers, cancer and cardiovascular disease. 
Now, first of all, when we want to study whether there's been improvements in our experience of cancer, what do we mean when we say we're doing better uh, when we are uh, treating or attacking cancer? Well, we could mean um, a bunch of different things. Uh, we could mean we're having an effect on the mortality of the disease. We're having an effect of, on the incidence of the disease, so there's less of it than there used to be. We're having an effect on the survival of the disease. That is to say, conditional on you getting cancer, you're more likely to survive uh, or survive longer. That's our big impact uh, on cancer with big medicine. Or we could be having an impact on the quality of life. And the quality of life, as we saw the last time, could could include a variety of measures, such as uh, limb or voice or breast sparing procedures, uh, palliation, side effect reduction. Even if you live the same amount of time, if you live that time with your limbs and other body parts intact or free of pain, that's more valuable than if you, you know, live that amount of time and are suffering. So the question of what to measure and how to measure it is contended, is, what, is in part what's under contention in the Baylor and Klausner readings uh, for today. Klausner was then the head of the National Cancer Institute. So the two of them are arguing, are we making progress in the so-called war on cancer? Uh, what aspects are we making progress on? And how should the resources be allocated? How should we spend money to tackle this war on cancer? And in many ways, figuring out what to measure and how to measure it is half the intellectual and, as it turns out, political battle. So now the three measures we're talking about are, of course, related. So if you imagine that there's some prior point in time on the far left, and then you're interested in the overall mortality, let's say birth, if you really want to go all the way back, and you're interested in overall mortality of cancer, uh, you might look at the number of people uh, dying of cancer divided by the total number of people, for example, who are alive, and say that's something to do with the mortality of cancer. Or you might be interested in the incidence or detection. So if we improve technology, maybe we will we'll just have an artificial and false confidence. We'll say, well, we've got, we invented CT scans. We used to have to wait till the tumor was erupting from your body, which would be here. But now we can detect it before it does that, maybe there. But you still die here. So now you're living longer after diagnosis, but actually it's a total artifact, right? There's been no real improvement in the disease. It's just an artificial improvement because you've moved up the ability to detect the disease to an earlier point in time. Or conditional on detection or incidence of the disease, maybe you can push the point of death forward by inventing treatments that actually lengthen survival. So these are different, these, these three temporal spells, the timing of incidence, the duration of survival, and the occurrence of death relative to some fixed point are obviously interrelated. If you change the timing of incidence by postponing it or of detection by accelerating it, you don't necessarily change overall mortality and there can be artifacts that arise. Um, so when Baylor, Baylor wrote the article that was assigned to you for the readings for today, because he had written a prior one in 1986, and he was, uh, he was heavily criticized. So Baylor in 1986 writes an article, not the one that you read. This is the article that he had previously written. And he said, look, we're losing the war on cancer. We're not making any progress. And people said uh, that new discoveries were just around the corner. We're going to discover penicillin, they said. We're going to find a cure for cancer. Stand by, Dr. Baylor. You will see, you naysayer you, they said to him. So he waited 20 years to see what happened. Uh, and he published the paper that you guys read. And he said, I'm still here, and there's no change. We're still not making any progress on the war on cancer. Uh, and they also quibbled with him on the way he measured success. Uh, and whereupon, what did his critics say to him in the response papers that Klausner says to Baylor in the new paper? They say, wait a minute, there's new discoveries around the corner. Come back in another 20 years. Now, poor Dr. Baylor is quite old, actually. And so I don't think he's, I'd love to write the next version of that 20 years from now and just see where we, uh, where we stand. So in fact, they said, no, 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 give us more money, more time. We're going to finally make progress. And I suspect the answer to that is unlikely to be the case. But what did Baylor argue? How are we doing when it comes to cancer? This slide shows mortality from all malignant cancers from 1970 through 1994 in the total US population according to race and sex. And these rates have been age adjusted. Remember when we talked about the measles point earlier that you have to adjust the age if you're going to compare things to see whether something is. For example, if we see that if we, if we have a society which is only populated by children, we shouldn't be surprised if there's no cancer mortality because cancer doesn't really affect children all that much. Okay. So we need to correct for the different age structures across time when we make these uh, comparisons. 
and it's been age adjusted to the US population from 1990. And you can see that the total mortality for cancer has not changed. So here in the red line is total mortality. It's about flat. Uh, for black males, it's gone up. Uh, for white males, it's sort of gone up. Uh, and for black females, it's gone up. And for white females, it's uh, sort of gone up uh, as well. And, uh, and, but when you look at this, you can also see that there seem to be widening differentials by race, for example. So black versus white men didn't differ very much in cancer mortality you know, in 1970, but the gap is getting bigger again. So here, too, we see widening differentials according to yet another socioeconomic aspect. That's to say uh, race. Now, this age adjustment, what's the point of it? Because as you may have, I hope if you, when you did the readings, you saw that they're arguing about the age adjustment. So let's, let's illustrate that point by, or let's punch it home by a quick illustration. Let's say we looked at the number of deaths per capita in Sweden and Panama, and we saw figures like this. So here is uh, here's Sweden and here's Panama. Here's the number of deaths. Here's the total population. And we say, you know, holy Toledo, the Swedes are much less healthy than the Panamanians. Would that be a reasonable conclusion? Now, you know the Swedes are not, but why? What's the explanation for this? This is the actual numbers if you did this, yeah? The population of Sweden is much, much older than the population of Panama. Exactly. So that's where I've been leading. So the fact is that Swedes are all older, so they're dropping like flies at the age of 80, and that's not what's happening here uh, in Panama. So we need to correct for the age in the two uh, populations. And when we do that, when we take into account age and we compare each population, uh, we standardize it to a same age distribution in the two populations, we see that actually, not surprisingly, the Swedes have a better age-adjusted mortality than the uh, Panamanians. And of course, one might want to adjust for other things beyond the age structure of the population as well. For example, one might want to consider other factors like race, or maybe if there's a big sex difference in the population, or even other attributes beyond that. And this procedure also helps to account for the fact that as we make progress against some diseases, the age structure of the population can change. So for example, a decline in infectious diseases leads to us having an older population, and we may then wrongly conclude that cancer has become a bigger killer Whereas it was the same killer it always was, it just has now more suitable victims. So as we prevent neonatal death, people get older in the society and we think, oh my god, we have an epidemic of cancer. No, it's just that we have more old people and they're the ones that are dying. However, updating these data since the Baylor-Klausner exchange does suggest that there is a trend in the early 1990s of declining death rates from cancer that has continued until today. So maybe Klausner well, had, a, had a point to some extent after all. But even, even if so, this can hardly be termed a victory in the war against cancer for two reasons. First of all, at best, we're just now getting back to where we were in the 1950s. So here's the mortality in 1950. Now we've had this decades of the war on cancer, and we finally are back to the future. You know, we're back where we were uh, in 1950, not even yet, uh, in terms of our mortality. Yeah. It's possible there was some misdiagnosis. That's a very good point. But they have been able to use very good data from like autopsy records and things when they were open to ad address that to some extent. That's a very good question. But that's not a big uh, explanation for this. Um, and this, and first point. So the first point is that this is hardly a victory. And the second point is, is that this still doesn't address whether it's treatment or prevention that's most responsible for this decline. So even if it is in fact now recently finally declining, it doesn't mean that it's treatment for cancer that's having uh, this impact. And in fact, close examination of which cancers have been declining, as Baylor shows, reveals that the diseases that have declined in the recent period appear to have done so either in response to changes in health habits, like we're finally quitting smoking as a society, and that's bringing our cancer rates down, or screening practices for colorectal breast or prostate cancer, which are a preventive measure, not a therapeutic measure. And this, after all, is the underlying political debate. Do we treat cancer on a case-by-case -case basis using individual medical care, such as chemotherapy, or on a collective basis using public health interventions, such as screening or health education campaigns? And Baylor is saying, look at the way I see the world. If you looked at the world the way I see it, you would allocate federal dollars differently. You would have different public policies, and it's those policies that would improve the health of the public, not the billions you're spending on chemotherapy closing the barn door after the horse is gone. 
And the argument that it is not big medicine that is most responsible for any progress we have made in cancer mortality, but rather prevention and public health interventions, strikes me as very compelling. Here are some ways to prevent cancer and truly reduce cancer mortality. Decreasing tobacco use, which we'll discuss later in the course. Decreasing, uh, decreasing exposure to uh, environmental carcinogens. Changes in diet or personal habits. And in the employment of secondary prevention, such as pap smears or colonoscopy. And note that chemotherapy is not on this list as a thing that's had a big impact in declining cancer mortality in our society in the latter part of the last century. Now let's turn to look at what's been happening analogously to cardiovascular disease, because it too has been declining since the 1960s. These are standardized rates, uh, standardized to the 1940 United States population. This is mortality rate per 100,000. Total cardiovascular disease roughly constant, maybe increasing a little, peaking in 1960 and has been declining since then. Uh, so have the subcategories and, of coronary artery disease, uh, and so has a stroke, for example. So what are some explanations for this decline? Well, once again, tobacco doesn't just kill you by uh, giving you lung cancer and other cancers. It kills you by causing your uh, heart disease. Um, and there's been a decline in that. Changes in diet, perhaps a decrease in fat consumption has been de contributing to this decline. Increase in the proportion of hypertensive people being treated effectively. Maybe some impact of treatment for high blood pressure. So we treat people's high blood pressure to prevent them from getting more serious heart disease later on. A decline in blood pressure, people's blood pressure, for reasons we don't fully understand, seem to be declining across time. A decline in cholesterol levels, which is also high cholesterol is a risk. Improvements in medical care, especially since the 1970s, drugs like beta blockers, aspirin and heparin and various thrombolytics, technologies like stents and surgery, ICU, and even the fact that we have now a national EMT kind of ambulance program that gets people to the hospital very quickly after they uh, collapse on the street. Maybe all of those things are contributing. And maybe possibly a prior decline in infectious diseases and inflammation. Maybe one of the reasons that heart disease is declining is that in decades past, the people who are elderly in this sample, when they were children, they didn't have as many infectious diseases. And maybe those infectious diseases, when we prevent those, that's what's keeping them healthy because of some biological relationship between early infections and late life cardiovascular illness. Cutler estimates, uh, in the reading for today, Cutler estimates that the discovery and use of post-heart uh, attack treatments has contributed about a third uh, of the decline, to a third of the decline in cardiovascular mortality. So things doctors do after you get a heart attack are, about a, are responsible for about a third in that decline. The use of preventive medications, for instance, reduction of uh, blood pressure or cholesterol or treatment of diabetes using insulin, have also helped and may account for about a third, and behavior change probably explains the remaining third in his judgment. Now, curiosity about the explanation for the observed decline in coronary disease spawned uh, something, uh, a big study done by the World Health Organization known as the Monica Project in the 1980s. And this was a 10-year study of trends in cardiac disease and its risk factors in 38 populations in 21 countries around the world ranging from the United States to Spain to China. And this is a very subtle and very interesting intellectual point. I think a really clever use of data. Let me show you how they used it. One of the key questions in the study was this. Could any declines in blood pressure noted over the 10-year period be attributed to its treatment? Why is blood pressure declining in our society? What's going on? Is it that people are being treated for having a high blood pressure? Or is something else happening? And there's some weird phenomenon whereby people's blood pressure is getting lower. Just like there's this weird phenomenon where I told you about a few lectures ago that people's IQ is getting higher, maybe something is happening in a secular way across the entire uh, society. And so what they said was, is look, if we plot for it, 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 uh, you know, every few years, if we look at the distribution of blood pressure, if it's the impact of big medicine, what we should see is this kind of change or deformation. You should go from the blue line to the red line across time. These people who had high blood pressure here, who are the ones you would treat, their blood pressure would decline. They, those people would disappear from the distribution. But they don't disappear from the surface of the planet. They have to appear somewhere else. So they would appear over here. They would kind of create this little bump. Whereas if, in fact, it was something else going on, and it wasn't the treatment for the condition, you'd see a smooth shift of the entire distribution to the left. Because, in fact, we're not giving anti-blood pressure pills to people at the bottom of the distribution. So if we see a whole shift to the left, it must be something like socioeconomic uh, change. 
Um, so the question is, the, that the Monica study asked is, was there a decline in blood pressure only in certain parts of the curve, i.e. in high readings, or across the entire population with similar falls in the bottom, middle, and top of the distribution? Since people at the bottom are not being treated with blood pressure medicine, if declines are seen across the entire distribution, it would suggest something other than the treatment of high-risk individuals with drugs that's causing this decline in blood pressure in our society. So once again, what happens is, is if it's some kind of better treatment, you get move people from these cells to these cells. You, know, you drop them by 10 blood pressure points or something. Whereas if it's a secular change, the whole distribution shifts to the left. And in fact, what they found uh, was exactly this shift to the left. So for example, use this as uh, another study similar to the Monica study. Uh, if you look at the distribution of blood pressure in 64, 78, and 1991, the curve keeps shifting to the left, uh, at least in European countries, across this time. So this decline, in fact, occurred even before the widespread use of effective antihypertensive treatments, just like the McEwen hypothesis we discussed at the beginning for infectious diseases. And in fact, not every, not every secular trend in human biology must be due to the use of medication. Since, for example, even menarche, which is the age at onset of first uh, menstrual period in, in girls, has shown similar change, and there's no sense in which this has arisen from a deliberate use of medication. So we have some very good data about the age at menarche in the Scandinavian countries, literally from over 100 years ago. And if you look at the age and onset of first period, across all these countries across time, there's been an ongoing decline. I think the median age at menarche in the United States right now is 11. It means 50% of girls have their first period before they're 11 years old, 50%. Uh, so a, a big shift that's been taking place. And it's not because we're giving uh, anyone uh, drugs. Yeah, I mean, if. Uh, I won't go into that right now, but <laughs> I mean, 11 is sixth grade, people. That means half the girls in our country already have had their first period, you know, some in fourth grade or fifth grade. I mean, think about what a challenge it must be to be a fourth grade girl with your first period, you know? It's, you know, what's that famous book? Um, it's me, God, I'm, it's me, Margaret. What is it? Yeah, are you there, God, it's me, Margaret, exactly. So that's why that book is so helpful. OK. So the balance of prevention and therapy, um, the balance of prevention and therapy um, has always, always needs to be assessed. And it is politically contentious, as we saw in the Baylor and Klausner exchange. And according to Cutler in the reading for today, a typical adult will require that $30,000 be spent in cardiovascular treatment over a lifetime, but gains about $120,000 in net present value due to increased longevity for a return, of invest a return on investment of about four. But a typical adult will require that $1,000 be spent on cardiovascular behavior change and prevention, but gains between seven dollars and $30,000 in net present value due to increased longevity. So the ROI for preventive interventions is twice or between twice and 10 times as high as the ROI for, uh, for treatment uh, interventions. And the issue of prevention versus treatment will be a recurrent theme during this class. We're going to nail this one. We're going to keep coming back to it. Now, uh, to close with a couple of ideas. All of these changes in disease incidence, whatever their cause, are not going to make us immortal. These observations about increasing life expectancy, however, do raise the question of what the upper limit of human longevity might be. What if current trends continue, then how long might we live? Here are some estimates of maximum life expectancy at birth based on various long-lived populations. Here is life expectancy at birth in the United States in 1986. The Japanese are better than us. Mormon high priests have exceptional, exceptional longevity because of, they have phenomenal, um, well, first of all, they're very esteemed members of their community. They have very high socioeconomic status, and they have ex excellent health behaviors. And here's a model from Ken Manton's group that estimated if human beings were to do everything that we know that's best for us, wear your seatbelt, don't smoke, get the screening test, brush your teeth, get good night's sleep, and all that stuff, if you did absolutely everything, that would give us a life expectancy at birth of about 100 years, but it would not make us immortal. So another way to think about this is as follows. Imagine that we could divide the causes of death in human beings into two broad categories, intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic causes of death arise from the failure of biological processes that originate within the organism, something to do with us, something to do with cellular apoptosis, for example, or cellular death or something to do with telomere shortening over the course of life, 
or other kinds of things that happen in our own biology that lead us inevitably to die. Those would be intrinsic causes. And extrinsic causes of death are things that happen, are imposed on the organism from outside forces. You know, trees falling on us, germs attacking us, other people being violent towards us, all of that stuff that comes from outside of our body. And consider an experiment in which animals were maintained in an optimal environment where they are completely protected from infectious diseases, aggression, accidents, and so forth, and all deaths arising from external forces have been eliminated, and every animal in this population would theoretically achieve their lifespan potential and succumb eventually to an intrinsic cause of death. So if we eliminated all the extrinsic causes, would we live forever or, for a very, or perhaps for a very long time? And could we also even make progress against the intrinsic causes? For example, with gene therapy or nanotechnology or cyborg technologies, which we'll also discuss towards the end of the class. And this has resulted in a debate amongst various kinds of scientists. Um, so it's, people are debating, well, what would happen if we, could, if we could eliminate all extrinsic causes? And maybe if we could eliminate all intrinsic causes, could we become immortal? Or could we at least live for a very, very long time? And when scientists have this kind of debate, sometimes they make a bet. And there's a long and famous tradition of scientific bets that are intended to distill arguments to their essence and force people to think as clearly as possible. There have been a number of famous historical bets. For instance, uh, Alfred Lord Wallace, the famous naturalist, bet John Hampton in 1870 that the Earth was not flat. I don't know how Hampton had that idea, but he did. So they took a bet. Uh, in 1980, economist Julian Simon bet population biologist Paul Ehrlich that the price of metals would decline over 10 years. Another bet. And in 2005, there was a bet that was made that was relevant to what we've been discussing, namely that people would not live to be 150. And it relates to intrinsic versus extrinsic mortality and the upper limit of human lifespan. So if we progressively fix all the extrinsic causes, would we live to be much longer, namely more than 150 years old? Uh, and this is the famous olshansky ousted bet. And on one side of the bet is my colleague Jay Olshansky. He's a demographer. And he believes that 130 is the top end of human lifespan. Occasionally, very rarely, people live to be 130 or 120 or something. Not 130, but 120 nowadays. He thinks 130 is the best we can do. And on the other side is Stephen Alstead, who's a zoologist. He thinks that there's someone alive today that will be 150 years old by 2150. And to make it interesting, they bet $500, billion, $500 million. Uh, <laughs> And what they did is, is they, they each deposited $150 into a trust fund, and they obliged, and they were going to contribute little bits of money every year for the next 150 years, and through the magic of compound interest, this is going to balloon, and they obliged their heirs to contribute small amounts of money as well. <laughs> and, uh, and then they're going to have this adjudicated by three scientists appointed by the uh, American Academy for the Advancement of Science or some other equal organization then, who will decide in the year 2150, you'll all be dead, so will we, whether anyone on that day is alive that was born more than 150 years ago, and then pay the heirs of the different scientists uh, off on this bet. <laughs> now, it's interesting what is not a part of this bet. And what's not a part of this bet is whether everyone will have the opportunity to live to be 150, or whether, as seems so unavoidable, the rising tide will not lift all the boats but only some of the boats, those at the top of the SES scale. Maybe not everyone will have access to these improvements, whatever they might be and uh, whatever their extent. Thank you.